Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that everyone can hear me. I would like to welcome you to my webinar, Dam in Commercial Photography Environments, uh, brought by me and DamGuru.com. My presentation is uh, designed to accommodate uh, the beginners in Dam and uh, the uh, people that are already looking into Dam but haven't quite gotten their head around it yet. And this is in particular to commercial photography environments. So I'm talking about studios, uh, production houses, uh, freelance photographers even that either work on location or in studios. Let me get to my first slide. I'm the managing director of In Transit Images, which is a boutique stock house based in Montreal and active in 22 countries around the world. I'm also a consultant and a photographer. Uh, as I started in Bob Hendricks Concepts, which is my own visual production house uh, that I run for Montreal as well. And I'm the president at the Young Photographers Alliance based in New York, which is a not-for-profit organization for um, uh, career startups for young photographers. Below are my contact details, but they will appear later as well. Let's start with the actual presentation, which is sketch the landscape in commercial photography environments in general. What, how do they normally function? Uh, for the people that work in this day to day, they will, uh, they will understand this really well. For the people not so familiar with it, they can at least recognize certain elements in that. A sample commercial photography workflow. Um, and this is not necessarily in a particular order. I know photographers that are actually far more random about this order, but there is some logic to this order, which is often it starts in a studio and location. Either photographers work, you know, at events, at uh, in offices from clients, in um, uh, outside locations uh, assigned by clients, uh, or in their own studio, rent the studios. It literally could be anywhere where they're willing and able to drag their equipment to. Then there is, I call it online and offline capture. Um, online capture is that you are in a studio and you tether your camera to a computer and you will impress and present the pictures immediately to your clients. Offline capture is that you shoot purely on your cards. And those cards get rounded up, they get ingested in a machine much later on in computers, either in a hotel room or in your studio or in your office, wherever it might be. Then those files that are created during those shoots are often put in assignment folders, project folders. Um, I know photographers that, that organize in particular ways. Um, for myself, I'm often working by project folders where I actually assign with the client abbreviation first, which is uh, three or four digits, and then with the date of the project, uh, either by specific date, by day, or by month, uh, and then um, uh, by the type of assignment uh, that may be, or the project it may be. There's also a whole other group of photographers that do a cumulative capture. Cumulative capture means that they will do folders at a certain size, uh, and they will keep counting. You know, as long as as long as they have an ID on uh, um, uh, on their files that just keeps counting, they will keep putting images, their raw files, their uh, capture files into a folder. And if that folder reaches a certain size, they will actually create a new folder and do it in there. Um, the one thing with that is that you have, you know, an absolute lineup of all the files that you ever shot. Um, but with no tags to it at that point in time, it can be challenging to actually find the folders unless you have a pretty good idea of what the date was. With these three elements in place, there is often some kind of workflow software in place. Uh, Adobe Lightroom, uh, Capture One are two good examples. I'm sure there is some, uh, some bigger ones, some larger ones, um, some smaller ones. Um, in any case, most photographers, I hope, digital photographers in particular nowadays, have some application in place where they actually manage the capture files and uh, uh, preferably all the files that come out of that as well, like master files. Uh, these software packages provide always uh, the um, the um, possibility of working with raw files. They ingest them really quickly. 
and they work with them very well. You can do some basic editing in that. And the direct output, I call it, which is the moment where a client is either on site or immediately on the phone after a shoot where they say, well, we would like to see what has been shot because we may need to make selections. Before you send it to us, can you provide us with a selection um, where you take out all the quirky ones that you are definitely not happy with? The direct output is often based on capture only. And they're either used for proofing, for selection. They, it either comes online or offline. I've had clients being perfectly happy with computer-generated contact sheets uh, coming directly out of Capture One or Lightroom. Uh, I have clients that want to have it off, uh, online and want to have galleries either through the back end of uh, a website or even a Dropbox gallery. Uh, all those options are available, but it's important to know that this is sometimes an in-between step that detracts from the initial edits to be made. But at that point in time, we often start post-production, which are enhancements like cropping, color correction, retouching, which in people's shots could be, you know, smoothening out skins, color, uh, skin tones, etc., or heavy composi uh, compositing, uh, which is combining several shots together into one. Uh, retouching several of those shots and making a one desired file out of it. And then the delivery uh, is either offline or online as well, depending on the nature of the shoot, depending on the preferences of the client, whether that is an intermediary company like an advertising agency or a uh, end user uh, like a company ordering your services directly. Online would be FTP, which is the file transfer probably behind your website or any galleries. Uh, that they can download directly from, depending on the size of the files that is feasible or not or practical. And offline, which is DVDs in most cases, uh, thumb drives are being requested sometimes and for the really large projects, and then I'm talking about projects that require, um, in our instance, 50, 60 gigabytes and up, uh, we actually have uh, custom-made hard drives that we send out to the client that um, they are able to keep on file and that we have branded with uh, our own logo, etc. And then from there on, with no modifications requested by the clients, we have storage and backup. Storage, which is a safe way to put those files for, for future reference. Uh, when the client comes back, you actually go there uh, and you pick up the files that they requested. And in storage, you need to make sure that you have a very good backup as well, preferably multiple. From there on, you will see that within that workflow, and we'll get to the, the damn part later on, but within a, a, a workflow like this, you will have several uh, different file categories, file formats. Um, the capture file is often raw, TIFF, JPEG, uh, a large format JPEG. Um, from those capture files, you often have a selected set of files uh, that you go over and narrows down the group of images. Um, from those files, either to enhancement, to retouching, or to compositing, you will end up with master files that are, in most cases, JPEG, which I don't recommend as a master file, since it's a com uh, compression-sensitive file. Uh, that means that if you open and close it a lot of times, it will actually start to deteriorate in quality because it compresses the pixels together and uncompresses when it's open. PSD and TIFF. PSD and TIFF, I think, are uh, the most widely used master files simply because they don't have that compression issue. Uh, and PSD, in some cases, is a lot more um, uh, efficient to work with. However, it can cause some conflicts if you work in different versions of Photoshop. Then there is derivative files. In our case, those are the files that we often give to our clients. Uh, preview thumbnail files, those could be quick files that you uh, provide them online or on a contact sheet. Uh, those would be JPEG and PNGs. Output files in high resolution, uh, the Photoshop files, PSD, JPEG, and PNG. Um, in some rare cases are TIFFs, but I can imagine there's other workflows where TIFF is, uh, is much, much more present as a high resolution output file. And then there is a low resolution output file, often directly to use for the web, which are JPEGs and PNGs.
this slide gives you the overview of you know the basics uh, in terms of file formats, file categories, with if derivatives within that workflow that I previously showed. Within the workflow, you often have, and, and I've seen this with many different companies, there is a certain set of software that is used. Uh, you'd be surprised perhaps to hear that the native operating system, the native OS, whether on PC or Mac, is actually often used as a form of organization. I mentioned before the folders uh, that are being made by an accumulative shooting range would be um, organized on native OS. And over that operating system, there is often a layer of software in the form of work so workflow software. Lightroom, Capture One are the most, probably the most common uh, software packages being used in commercial photography nowadays. And then there's photo editing software. I mentioned Photoshop because it's probably the most wide, well known and, uh, and widespread one, uh, but I'm sure there is some specific uh, photo editing software. Um, accommodating certain specific uh, requirements from, for certain photographers. And then there's utilities, which is another layer, either integrated with Photoshop or with uh, Lightroom, or they come standalone. A lot of utilities are being offered as plugins into Photoshop, uh, and some of them have standalone versions as well. Uh, those utilities could do anything from smoothening out digital noise that has been created in photographs, uh, to advanced mini workflows to crop images to a certain size or to a, enlarge them. The next step in the landscape, these bullets here that I have here, describe what challenges you would have with no dam or a partial dam in your workflow. Partial dam is you kind of started with it, but it's not available on all files, or it's an incomplete uh, metadata profile which means that you have your copyright notice in there, your website, but not necessarily all the keywords, or never thought about completing the taxonomy of, those, uh, of, that, uh, of that data. So you will have an inaccurate or inconsistent metadata. Um, you cannot find your files. Uh, you will have, ultimately, for, for feeds and outputs, you will have to have some manual processes in this, the best example that I can come up with for a manual feed, for example, is if you have one of those templated websites, and for photographers that could be Photo Shelter, uh, Lifebooks, uh, but probably even Wix or Squarespace, let's call them all so that I don't have any preference, the manual feeds um, will be that you upload your images there, it will extract all the embedded information, but you don't necessarily have keywords in there. And all those templates, all those providers of those websites uh, pride themselves on the fact that they have a large SEO optimization. So people can actually find your images based on name or subject matter, for example, and they use metadata for that. So they will always ask you to create a profile manually in, in the back end of those websites to actually put in keywords, etc. And that becomes a manual, a manual task if you, if you don't already have that in the files from your in-studio uh, or in-office workflow. And therefore, you get um, uh, no overview. You have no idea what is where, where you can find what where, and therefore a lack of management as well. Now, I think that the earliest form of them was filing cabinets, at least in my case, filing cabinets with literally books and books of negatives. And on those negatives, you actually had some stickers on those pages. And on the filing cabinet, you had cards on the drawers. And they were either organized by, um, by um, a year, or by description, or by client even. And um, this is how you would find your files. Um, just extrapolate that to a digital world where uh, you basically have that filing cabinet on sitting on a computer or on a hard drive and where you cannot find what a client is asking for. Either this is a client that did a project uh, 12 months ago or a, pro a client with a project last week, or you have people working in your office that actually need to look on your behalf and they don't necessarily have the memory of the projects that you have run. and that has some consequences, and not only in a technological sense, uh, the example of 
uh, websites is one that I gave before, but actually in a business sense. If you have no ability to search or find those files uh, neutrally in terms of everyone could do it if they get the search engine in, in front of them, you will also have an inefficient workflow and you have an inefficient set of processes. You will eventually uh, have to look at lost or missing files, not necessarily because they're not physically there, but no one really knows where they are. That means that if you send those images out into the world, that, you, uh, that your clients, uh, maybe even stock agencies, will not be able to read those files or place those files. They call them orphan files, uh, files that cannot be traced back to its original creator uh, or owner. Uh, unidentified files if they end up in a big corporation, which is your client, and cannot be traced back by the right keywords. You're also unable to share the files. Um, one of them would be the feeds example that I previously mentioned, but it could very well be share the files with clients before you actually uh, deliver the final files. It could also share your files with your team. Maybe you have a retoucher on the other side of the country that you need to share those files with and she or he needs to be able to look for those files by keyword to make sure that you're working on the same files or on the same client and file name is often not enough. If clients or stock agencies or anything else need to have the nitty gritty on the details with these files, um, especially copyright, user rights, credits, uh, uh, if you're in photo, photojournalism, that can become an issue. At the end of the line, it means that the business effect that uh, no or partial dam has is that you have the risk of losing out on money, losing out on revenues, losing out on profits, and ultimately that is uh, a part of what you're probably in the game for. The next part will be about if you actually put them in commercial photography environments. And those, again, I would like to emphasize, those are fairly basic environments. There is all kinds of custom and specific environments where um, where you can elaborate on, on very specific packages, on custom development connected to a DAM system. What I'm trying to describe here is a very basic environment where there is a handful of people working within a studio or within a office where they do production work with regard to commercial photography. Without giving a complete sentence or a definition of four lines for, for that matter, uh, the definition for uh, damning commercial environments is that you have a searchable database or library, depending on how you call it, with digital files in there. And digital is bracketed simply for the fact that uh, in some cases those are scan files, digital files as well, but they are sourced from negative scans. The difference between a database and library for anyone who would like to know there is none. It's just the terminology that is being used by one or the other person. I prefer a database, but then uh, look, with a technical background, you would probably call it like this. Uh, library is something that you often see coming up from photography-specific sources, uh, but the chances are that library is going to be confused with, for example, the library in Lightroom, which is really another catalog, and that's where it's gets even more complicated. So I will always uh, stick with database, but library is a good enough term to use alongside. Within that database, there, the images, the assets, are classified, cataloged, tagged, and keyworded. Uh, classified as in, you know, where do they belong? Are they, in some cases, personal work versus commercial work versus uh, not profit work? Um, um, when were they shot? There's all kinds of classifications you can put to it. Um, they are cataloged. There are certain catalogs that you can hold in this. That's why I don't like to use the word catalog uh, alongside database and library because catalog is really a subset of a database. Where they are tagged, uh, tagged in different matters according to the IPTC uh, profile, for example, and keyworded uh, where you assign um, keywords to some of the subject matter in the images. That same searchable database with now the assets all classified, cataloged, tagged, and keyworded 
make it possible to also retrieve those images. And you retrieve them by search engine. There's always a search bar somewhere that will allow you to type in, I guess, the color green or um, uh, the word landscape or the word uh, sun, and it will give you a whole set of images that are keyworded as such. And that will allow you to output, distribute, and store those images, uh, either as a subset, either as a total set. Um, these three bullets really, in a nutshell, uh, put in place why and how and what the definition would be of them in photography commercial and a uh, commercial photography environment. The building of a dam environment is often the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge uh, for building it is actually getting, for most people, uh, getting their head around it. Um, whether you're in the a commercial photography business for a few years or whether you're in the business for many decades, the challenges are often the same. Um, they're different, uh, different in the sense of how you, for example, deal with technology, uh, but at the same time, they come down to the same elements that need to be put in place. What I did from several dam-related projects uh, that, I, uh, that I that I consulted on or assisted with, there is a ha literally a handful of bullets that I would like to run through, and run through in specifics in the next slides. One is planning. Planning is almost everything, not only in business in general, but with with pertaining to dam. That is really what you, what you need to do first. If you don't plan. Um, then um, it, you're going to run into some obstacles uh, somewhere down the line. And planning can also mean doing your research, um, getting familiar with the jargon being used in them, um, brushing up on some of the, the uh, technology essentials that you need to know and need to be put in place. It also makes you ask about what your budget is, how much you have to spend for this, what the requirements are how you will deal with the integration, especially if you work with multiple people in an environment. The next one is OS environment. This probably determines in 90, 80 or 90 percent of the cases, determines what kind of package, what kind of application you're going to look at, uh, and also how you're going to structure this on your actual system, on your actual computer. Uh, and this often becomes the PC versus Mac uh, uh, question, uh, but not necessarily just that, um, and on that more in a later slide. Storage. Storage is important because remember that all the data, all those images that you ever shot represent a commercial, have a commercial value. Uh, and um, you need to know how much active storage you have, which is the storage where your applications and your current data run on a PC with uh, versus the backup data that you have. And backup data nowadays easily increases um, tenfold if you're starting uh, to backup uh, in two or three versions uh, of the data already on an original hard drive or on a set of hard drives. The DAM application itself, there is a um, off-the-shelf version in most cases, which is available as a download. Um, and then there is custom. And there is a gray area in between. And the question is, which one is the best for you? Which one works really well? Um, this can be from a very simple, basic application uh, all the way up to extremely um, well-designed, um, customized uh, interfaces with other applications that you run in a large company. Uh, the gray area in between is that some of the shelf uh, packages also allow for some limited, in some cases, uh, customization and, and development and coding on, on your own. Uh, most photography studios that I know will not necessarily look at those large packages, um, but some of the shelf packages offer great, great customization uh, already and uh, are able, uh, you are able to brand your system, for example, to put logos in certain logo on screens, et cetera. Um, and data discipline. Data discipline is really a remainder on my side from the technology, um, uh, the technology days that I had. 
which was always make sure that all the work you do on the phone and in meetings with people that you translate all that new information into data that can be put in a CRM system, a customer relationship management system. Um, and the discipline needs to be in place to do that either on a uh, on an hourly, on a on a daily, on a weekly basis, but that the the data in the system is actually updated. And in this case, it pertains directly to make sure that if you have a new shoot that goes through or a new project, that the images related to that project are tagged and keyworded immediately. In some cases, you have assistants sitting on shoots that, especially with tethered shoots in studios where the camera is connected to the computer, uh, those keywords are generated immediately off on, on location. Uh, someone is typing them in as you go. Let's have a closer look at where all uh, some more details of each of those bullets. Planning for them. Uh, really, the three major ones would probably be, and we can probably uh, define them, which is brie, I guess. Uh, budget is one. What kind of uh, budget are you looking at for for hardware, software, and services? Uh, for hardware, hardware it could very well be that you're already working with older machines that have been written off um, over the years, over a period of three years, for example, and a good new refresher of of systems might be in the budget for it. And it might also be that you found a better application for Mac and you're currently working on some PC-based PC systems and you would like to make that switch. This could be something that you work into a budget like this. Um, in some cases, you want to maintain everything as you have, but you just want to expand on memory, hard drive space, etc., to make sure that uh, anything new running on, uh, with the application is going to be covered and will have enough resources to run with. Software. Software comes down to look for the right, the right damn applications. Uh, make sure that um, you uh, look at what you need, how the interface looks. Um, I later on I will also um, I will also point out to download trials. Make sure you run these applications. Make sure you wonder what you need within your environment. That can be very basic, and there is nothing, uh, nothing that would stop you off choosing one of the entry systems into a digital asset management application. One of the things often forgotten is that services, uh, the cost of setting it up, for example, by a technician, or maintaining a system by an administrator, for example, uh, on a monthly or even an annual basis uh, are things that you need to budget for. And if you don't have the skills or the, the knowledge in-house, you need to get it somewhere else. And that can run up very, very quickly. From my own experience, we have certain applications that run and we were able to integrate ourselves, whereas we have one much larger application running where we needed extensive consultants coming in, setting and preparing the systems and at the same time they require a monthly maintenance where people actually maintain the, the hardware underneath the actual software itself uh, to make sure it can all run smoothly and systems are not overloaded. By looking at the budget for all of this, the requirements are as important and probably integrated. Uh, return on investment, ROI, uh, in some cases you can actually calculate and say, if I invest a thousand dollars, how much is it going to save me somewhere down the line? And keep in mind the one of the previous slides that actually pointed out what the business issues would be or the challenges are if you do not uh, have them in place. How often did you encounter uh, a client coming back to you and you not being able to provide the files that they asked for, which you could charge a usage fee for? How many times have you delivered stock imagery and knew that that wasn't the whole collection you had ready for it, or you simply couldn't find part of it? Those are missed opportunities for uh, revenue, and that could be translated into the return on investment you would have if you installed that. One of the most important things is scalability. I know that most photographers that I work with, uh, they would probably have over their 
and then it's my age. Most of those photographers probably have anywhere between 100,000, 500,000 images. Um, some of them are the master files that they created for the client. Some of them are simply an, ar an archive of their capture. Those are pretty large amounts of data already that runs in the terabytes. It's very important to more or less be able to calculate and say, in about three to five years time, I will have doubled that amount based on the frequency of shooting right now. Uh, and a system needs to be able to run for that. For example, the, one of the most basic systems uh, in them would be Lightroom. Uh, other than being a workflow program, you can actually search for certain keywords and you can actually look for certain tags and you can actually apply certain metadata profiles to each individual image or to groups. However, this system has limitations in terms of how many assets it can run, how big its catalog gets uh, before it starts being either really slow or not functional at all anymore. Those are all uh, considerations with regard to scalability and it's highly personal, it's highly um, uh, specific to the environment it runs in. The OS available, we spoke about that in hardware and software. Um, in some cases, the PC versions are, there are more PC versions widely available for DAM software than there are on Mac. Uh, on Mac, it might be that it's slightly more stable. Um, depending on all these factors, you can either consider what you like best, uh, or you can ask advice. Uh, Damn Guru is a great platform where that advice could follow on, especially if you have certain specifics in place. Connectivity. Um, connectivity is on multiple levels, but connectivity in, in this one is cross-platform. If you have your primary application running on a PC with a with with them on it, and you want to log on with your Mac-based uh, laptop because it really is great on the road. You need to be able to make sure that uh, through not too many interfaces, you can actually work with that. That that computers talk to each other, even if they don't necessarily have the same operating system. Connectivity could also mean that if you work with some cloud-based uh, uh, storage or did you connect to other systems, for example, the ones with your website on it, that those can talk to each other as well. Uh, so connectivity and knowing where either the computer that will run the DAM software or um, the DAM software itself needs to talk to is really important. And then availability. Availability is twofold. One is the uptime of the actual system the stability of the actual system. Um, I think there is numbers available on today's um, uh, operating systems and how stable they are, especially if you have a server-like computer running a DAM application so that it's available almost 24-7. You need to make sure that the actual computer can maintain that uptime and has that stability to not crash You know, if it runs too long. The other point of availability is the development path of the actual, the actual, um, um, of the actual DAM application that um, that is being sold by a company. What updates or upgrades uh, do they have planned? Do they have a, a roadmap for a certain application? Which means that they have actually put out. Currently, they're at version 2.4, and they know that by next year, they have a few changes they want to make, and they will call it uh, uh, version uh, 3.0. Then there is going to be some minor glitches that need to be solved in version 3.1, and then uh, somewhere down the line, there is some, some uh, rather large expansions on, um, uh, on connectivity, connecting to other systems, being available to other systems, and that could become a version four. That is a roadmap that many developers have in place. Uh, not necessarily always public, but uh, most people will be able to inform you that uh, the company is a company that develops according to a plan 
and in that plan there is often uh, consumer input as well or a user input. Integration. So after determining the budget, after determining you know the specific requirements and, and the details on those, integration is as important. Give yourself time to integrate this system. Give it time to to, to work or to not work and know that you can change certain things, to tweak the system, to make sure that it runs exactly the way you want to, to customize that system if, you, if you're comfortable doing that self, yourself. That timeline um, can be anywhere from, I guess, a few weeks to a few months. The timeline might also be that you include working on legacy assets which means that everything you did before this time of integrating them into your environment, into your company, that you need to go back and say, oh, I really am going to have 100,000 old images to go through and, and make sure that they can all be found in my new system. That is a timeline that is often much longer. The current assets, you could probably get your head around pretty well um, because if you have a few projects running by yourself, you can do that yourself. If you have really dozens of projects running, you're probably running a much larger studio or environment, and therefore you have people that you can actually assign to these things. Legacy assets, not so much. And you could start in phases. You could start with the phases that are from active clients. You could start with um, uh, you could uh, you could start with uh, most recent projects for the last 24 months, for example and then build out outwards and backwards almost. Um, but this is important. This is exactly why you are integrating them as well, not only for now and for what you're going to do in the next few years, but also to ingest at least a part of your legacy assets, of the images you shot on the projects you were involved in and you would like to put in there. Integration is also about the knowledge base. Uh, building knowledge within your own team of people or by yourself, uh, acquiring that knowledge, um, uh, basically continuing where, you're, where you left off with your research. Build experience on the, on the system you have chosen with, practice with it, tweak with it, um, go to a seminar or a webinar about this. Most developers provide these. They have blogs where they put updates or very handy tips in there. That's the knowledge base you need to enlarge as well. And that is also a timeline you can you can calculate for. So this is, and let me check. This is very much where the planning comes in. After this, it goes a little bit a, lo a little bit quicker. Assessing your systems, you check what kind of systems am I running? What system would I would I would like for this? Do I like a desktop? Do I like a server? How am I going to prepare my storage? What backups do I need? What is the capacities that I need? Um, I can tell you there is no real rule of thumb for the ratios of it, but I can tell you that my ratios are always uh, extremely large um, in the sense that if I have one factor of current data that I need, which is uh, in most cases uh, three terabytes, multiple systems, I would probably have about 40, uh, 40 to 50 terabytes at this point in terms of uh, a variety of backups. So that's, that's the, the ratio that I have, but there is no real one on it, depending on specific environments. Also, a good question to ask yourself, uh, am I working in a, in a work group? Is this computer or server going to stand alone? Is there going to be LAN stations for, um, for data entry? Uh, within the same site or even off-site and for off-site do I have connectivity needs? Do I have connectivity needs for any other systems where customized um, uh, customized modules from other systems need to talk with? DAM application. Um, research, most important thing. Read as much as you can about it. Uh, look at uh, uh, several offerings in the marketplace. Combine those with your operating system environment needs, um, the needs for your customization. Uh, can you start with a basic and continue from there on, or do you need straight of the get-go a, customize, a customizable system? Connectivity, 
in this case means an API? Does it need to talk to a website? Does it need to talk to sales systems? Does it need to talk to CRM systems, to any other modules of any other, uh, uh, any other uh, enterprise packages in some cases? Modular package is really uh, to say that most suppliers can have you start off with a basic package and actually have modules you can add on. Uh, especially if there's annual charges involved, you can actually add on certain things and decide if they work for you or not, uh, but you can expand over time. And then based on all this is that you trial, you download free trials, most mostly available with every developer out there, and you test how is my experience working on the system and how is the interface for it. In terms of integration, changing your processes and workflow is the most important thing. Uh, the best thing that I have always done was actually draw it out uh, on a piece of paper and uh, draw my existing workflow. And then with a red pen actually go over it and see where that needs to be adjusted. And then in that <laughs> red version of it, uh, decide where you are going to keyword, where you're going to put your metadata in, where you're going to... Um, where you're going to store, how that's going to be done, where you run your backups with your damn application. Um, those are important things. If you have decided that, and those, those are very specific to how you normally work, you implement that workflow. In some cases, step, step by step. And you test that workflow. Does it work for me? Does it work for the professionals that I work with? Does it work for the assistants? Does, does it work for the people that administrate a system like that? Uh, people that add metadata onto it, and you evaluate that and adjust. And then, especially if you work with a small team uh, and beyond, data discipline is extremely important. Uh, everyone should know that um, success of integrating a dam is based on data discipline. If you end up uh, with a very complex version or a very basic version of digital asset management, you will have achieved at least these four, which is a centralized searchable index database. Somewhere where you can go to, whether that is on multiple computers or on one, you will have a database on there that you can actually go through uh, the work, the images, the assets that you have, and actually look by keyword, by perhaps client, by date, etc., and find the images that you're looking for. You are able to share this internally, but externally as well. You can allow uh, clients to give access to this at certain levels. Uh, you can share this internally for your, your retouches, for example, to actually go and work on certain files. And then connectivity to related systems. And websites being nowadays a great example for that. Um, in addition to that, and I always bring this up because it sounds extremely good, Resource multiplier. Um, what you needed m probably one or two people for to do manually, go through a system and look for specific images, you can now do with one person. And that one person will do the work of, of one, two, maybe even three people uh, and can do that in a much shorter time. And a resource multiplier, every, any business person will tell you that, is always savings. Uh, you can, you can, uh, you do the work for one person. Uh, w one person can do the work of multiple other people. I see that I've seen some questions on my screen already, and I will go over those. Is there any reason why we should standardize on PSD instead of TIFF for masters? No techn technological reason that I can think of. I think they probably balance um, each other out with the pros and cons. Uh, I personally prefer PDSDs, but with PSDs, I'm always I'm always aware that there might be an issue in terms of uh, them being uh, accessible on older versions of Photoshop. So let's say uh, we're working all now, I guess, on uh, the the newest version uh, Photoshop. If you have anyone running an older version, let's say three or four versions ago. Uh, it might be that the PSD has trouble opening, and that might be if you're dealing with a corporate client that has older versions. Uh, TIFF, I don't necessarily like TIFF for uh, color reproduction uh, and for their 
for their multiple standards in between, the multiple specifications they, you can give them, especially if you save them in Photoshop, you will see all those specifications. Um, but TIFF is in that sense uh, a far more general um, a general format that, do, that does as well and it's probably beyond that. Uh, PSD you still need Photoshop for or at least a reader that can read this, whereas TIFF opens quite, quite well in, in most readers. Do you manage the master photos of your clients or do you give masters to your clients after a shoot is done? If you manage them, do you charge for this? Um, for, for commercial photography, I um, give them masters. Uh, I always call them uh, probably submasters in the sense that uh, whatever PSDs I have created with extensive retouching or compositing, I will not necessarily give them the masters reflecting all the layers in it that did this because that would be showing them the recipe in the kitchen. Uh, no, I would. I would give them um, flattened versions of the masters if they require so. And I would pro probably provide them in PSD and TIFF, knowing that either one of them can be read or can be a preference to whoever they work with or the person who works with in the company. Um, so yes, but it's still a derivative of my own master, my in-house master. And then I, the derivatives coming from there are uh, the JPEGs, the TIFFs, the, the flattened PSDs, the flattened TIFFs, uh, and PNGs in some cases. If I would manage those, no. The charge is is minimal, uh, and the archive I hold is um, the service that I provide to my clients. However, if a client comes back and he needs to retrieve certain images and they need to be put on DVD or on an FTP, there might be some charges involved for that. It depends on the nature of the project and the client and the work involved. Next question is, do you have a common taxonomy keyword that you use for all clients or do you have different ones for each client? I have a standard, um, it's, it's called a um, controlled vocabulary. Uh, and controlled vocabulary is basically a large almost word file where uh, you have uh, pretty much in taxonomy and keywords loaded into and you can load that into either uh, I have it loaded it in the past into Lightroom but I've seen it loaded into other uh, DAM applications and that is a good starting point however for certain clients I have specific um, jargon terms um, uh, some of my clients are mining uh, companies and they have specific words for certain sites or for um, for certain situations um, so I will customize the controlled vocabulary that I acquired I purchased that and then from there on I actually uh, customized it uh, for my own needs and in some cases that is um, specific keywords for certain clients very interesting question. Is it better to add keywords in Lightroom or Bridge, or do you wait until the dam? Bridge in my world is not necessarily a uh, commercial application. Um, Lightroom does its job better, and they are pretty much... Bridge doesn't do everything that Lightroom does, but Lightroom definitely does what Bridge does. Um, I shoot often in combination with Lightroom. Uh, or with Capture One, and I will load those keywords already into Lightroom or Capture One, uh, and then take it from there. Um, but if if I look at the DAM workflow we have with the DAM application, those same keyword sets are loaded into the DAM application as well. That at any given point in time, we can add keywords wherever we need to. We have multiple keywords in multiple companies. Do you store on a cloud? cloud drive or do you keep things local? <laughs> That's a great question. One of our workflows is so large that it is simply unattainable to upload all those files to um, a cloud drive or a data center. They're literally 500 MB files and then they're coming at thousands at the same time. Um, in most cases what I do is I have multiple backups and for all the servers and computers that I have here, I have a second version of that same drive 
that I will rotate with an off-site location and then create the same backups on. So ultimately, I always have probably four or five backups in play uh, within the office, and I always have two, two or three backups offsite, uh, so that and they are being rotated on a weekly basis. So whatever happens, I can always go either to my offsite backups or onsite. For one server in particular, we actually have a mirror set up uh, with a data center. Um, where we replicate with on a um, on a weekly basis, but that can get very costly if you actually uh, looking at multiple gigabytes. If you do this on a monthly basis, no unlimited no unlimited provider will <laughs> let you uh, unlimited do that. One, two is it also jeopardizes your bandwidth um, because it's it's a constant upload and download. So cloud cloud is a part of the backups uh, we hold. Um, we hold certain systems in the cloud. However, Lightroom, for example, does does not function or is not designed to work on a cloud backup and then picked up by another another drive. It doesn't it doesn't work like that. Any tips for migrating from a file server based workflow to a DAM? There are so many variables involved there. My my first response would be I would stick to the initial. Um, to the initial uh, tips that I had, which is research exactly what you want and what you need. Um, look at the requirements of your environment versus the environment you like to create. Um, look at the budget you have. And then from there on, um, phase, you probably need to face um, the integration, the setup of the dam first, and then the integration of its data. Uh, because I think that's what this is about, the data from a file server um, and the applications possibly as well. And then slowly switch over to a dam. But that can take a little bit of time. Uh, but with a, with sufficient planning, I think you, you get quite a little bit. We actually use, uh, I get the next question in. And I hope the previous question was answered, even though there's many more variables that we can discuss in detail. And you can you can email me for that if you'd like. The next question, do you use Dropbox or other commercial file sharing software? We have to admit that we use Dropbox. <laughs> it used to be called Dropbox for Teams. Um, it might be that it's called differently now, but we have basically a large allocation of Dropbox space, and we have divided that over our team. And uh, we exchange either in a team folder or individual folders the file that we need. However, we do not do this, do this for our uh, images, not for our digital assets, if it comes down to stills, photographs, uh, uh, videos, anything like that. No, our, our um, visual content that we produce or store is not, not done on Dropbox for the same reason as uh, uh, Lightroom or anything else that I mentioned before. The bandwidth, which is our bottleneck here, um, and in many locations as well, would not be wide enough to replicate with Dropbox, and Dropbox is just too impractical to to upload uh, 500 gigabytes to. It really doesn't work well, especially in indexing. You know, the next time it starts up, and then making sure it replicates on the other side. Beside the fact that the local folders that Dropbox has put a huge strain on local resources on a particular computer. So that means that if you have two people on one side, uh, on both sides of the Dropbox, and you have the server in the middle, I'm sure the server itself can carry the the load. Perhaps the person that uploads on one side also, but the person on the other side might not have a computer with enough storage space to receive all those files in, and, and he still has to work with them. So we actually, uh, for our digital assets, uh, run from uh, a different. Uh, uh, a different uh, location and different hardware and software where they can actually log into that. I would like to thank everyone for listening, for attending. Um, I hope this brought you anywhere closer to them or clarified a few things if you're wondering about it. Please feel free to contact me directly by email uh, or through a LinkedIn message. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dan Guru uh, for having me here today and um, and I will wish you a nice day. Thank you.